Hello, AP Biologists. Mrs. Greider here to talk about population growth, the packet that you got for homework tonight. As I mentioned in class, we are starting with model two, which looks like this, and is called a survivorship curve. A survivorship curve is just what it sounds like. It's a graph with a line on it, that's the curve, that illustrates how many of a particular population are surviving or not surviving, as the case may be. And there are three patterns that we see in survivorship curves that we'll talk about. The key things to notice on this are the axes. So down here is always the age on the x-axis, a representation of time. And then on the y-axis, I want you to notice that this is not your standard linear axis. It doesn't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Instead, it goes 10, 100, 1,000. So this is equally spaced numbers, but they are powers of 10. So this is what's called a logarithmic axis, and it's so that we can fit more data onto an axis at one time. So like I said before, a survivorship curve is a visual representation of when most individuals in a population survive or die. And there's three types, type one, type two, and type three, all of which feature the individuals in that population dying or most likely to die at slightly different times. So you can see here in the type three curve that there's a sharp decrease. So there's a lot of death at the beginning of life in a type three curve, and then it levels out. In a type two curve, death happens about equally all the way through the life of this organism. So there's no one time when they're more likely to live or die. And in a type one species, we see that they're most likely to live out through their younger ages, and then there's a lot of death toward the end of the life. So this is the actual survivorship curve that is in your packet with the type one, type two, and type three. And this is useful because it gives us another indication of what it means by age here on the bottom. And it's not just any age, it's age related to reproductive status that it has marked for you. So it's got newborns, pre-reproductive age, so before that organism is able to have children, reproductive age, and then post-reproductive age, so after an organism is too old to have kids. So when we look at it through that, those, that lens, we can see that the type three, we're really talking about a lot of death before the reproductive age, type two equal death throughout pre, during, and post-reproductive age. And for type ones, we're seeing a lot of survivorship during the reproductive age and then a sharp decline in the post-reproductive age. So the thing that the packet is trying to get you to think about is why would this happen? What would the circumstances be that would cause this to occur? So let's start with humans because we're humans. So that's a little easier. So for humans, right, think about how much care goes into caring for a new baby or a kid. And there are some kids and young adults who pass away, but it's relatively less common, right? A lot of care goes into feeding and housing and clothing that kid. A lot of investment is put forth by the parents or the community in order to make sure that that baby survives. Also, there are relatively few kids born in a type one curve. Humans only have one baby at a time and families tend to have to be relatively small. Once we go to type two, rodents, that's like rabbits and rats and mice and squirrels, the rodents we see have more equally distributed death. And because of that, why does this happen? Well, rodents are less likely to live at any one point. And we also know that they're likely to have more babies than humans and that more of those babies are likely to die. Why? Well, think about it. So it could be because of something in their environment, like a predator or it could be that resources are a little bit more scarce. So death is more equally distributed. The type three, fish, insects, and amphibians, type three tends to have a lot of, lay a lot of eggs, have a lot of offspring all at once, and then very few of them actually make it to reproductive age. And once again, that has to do with factors in the environment. Predation, lack of resources, and competition for resources will cause survivorship to be lower for those species. All right, I'm going to move on to model three right now, which are the growth curves. So in the growth curves, um, we can see that there are two types. There's an exponential growth curve over here and a logistic growth curve over here. 
And the first thing that I want to point out to you is that the axes are the same. So time is on the x-axis in both of them, and population number is on the y-axis in both of them. And if we look at the beginning of the curve, the beginning of the curve is exactly the same in both graphs. We have a lag phase that then rises, a lag phase that then rises, and the difference is really what happens in the second half of the graph. So in exponential growth, we see that the graph continues to climb and climb and climb, the population number increases and increases. Whereas in the logistic growth curve, we see that there's a leveling off of the population due to some sort of environmental resistance. We'll talk about what that means. And it reaches a number that we call the carrying capacity, which is always delineated as K. So, <coughs> excuse me, once again, graphs start off the same, but then end very differently. So that has to do with what the difference is, right? And so we know that the population numbers differ as time goes on in these curves. And we want to be thinking about what are the causes of that? So why is that going to happen? So let's start by talking about this phase that they have in common called the lag phase. So the lag phase is characterized by this really slow increase that comes before this more rapid increase in the second half of the graph. And that happens in both, once again, lag phase and then a sharp increase. And this has to do with the number of individuals that are available to reproduce at the beginning of the growth of that population. So we know that at the beginning, there's very few individuals. So even if they reproduce, there isn't going to be a huge increase in the overall number of the population. But once their offspring grow up and start to have babies as well, there will be a much sharper increase. Let me show you what that means. So here I've given you a similar situation to what would be for question number 14 in your packet. Mine is different than yours, though, so you have to do your own math for that. But I've given you an hour, and then the number of bacteria that exist at that hour for a bacteria that doubles once every hour. So here at the beginning, at hour zero, time equals zero, we have one bacteria. Hour number one, we have two, then four, eight, 16. So here we're at hour four, and you can see that we have barely increased at all. However, once we start to get down here in the latter half of my hours, once we get to hour seven, eight, nine, and 10, Doubling is making a much larger increase. So each time um, an hour passes, the number of bacteria increases by quite a bit. So this right here at the beginning is my lag phase. Very few bacteria to reproduce, so the number increases very slowly. However, once we get to the, this right here on six to eight, the number of bacteria has doubled such that another doubling increases the number of bacteria by quite a lot. So here we have the lag phase, and then eventually we'll get to this exponential growth phase. So the big question here is, what do these imply about the environment? So the big difference between A and B is that over here we just have growth and growth and growth in A, and over here the pressure begins due to environmental resistance. So over here in B, we have something in the environment that is causing this number of organisms to level off and to not be able to increase indefinitely. And over here in A, those environmental factors just don't exist. They're able to increase indefinitely. So this environmental resistance is going to lead to our carry capacity. One more slide. This is from our first um, packet that we did today, packet um, titled Population Density. And in this, this is giving some of the reasons that could be there for environmental resistance. So we talked about things that were density dependent and density independent. And these are simply limitations that the environment has that would stop an organism from being able to continue to reproduce. So for example, if the food supply runs out, then more reproduction isn't going to be able to happen. If water runs out, if a flood happens and kills off a bunch of organisms, if there's parasites or disease or drought or a lot of competition or a lot of predation, that means those animals are getting eaten, then there's a limit to how many more of that organism we could have in a given environment. There's going to be a cutoff point at which it's really just going to be able to stay constant because the environment and the ecosystem can't support more of that particular organism. So once again, Right here, this pressure is beginning during, begins due to environmental resistance. It's leveling off because there's limitations in the environment. And eventually we'll reach that carrying capacity. And that represents 
the number of organisms in the population that that particular environment can sustain over time. So this means that some individuals will still be born, some will die, but the overall number will remain relatively constant over time. Over here, none of those environmental constraints exist, so the population will just continue to increase and increase and increase. I hope that that has helped you with the population growth packet. If you have any questions, feel free to text or email me, and I'll see you soon. Bye.